Can y'all hear me now? Yep. There's a, my bad on that. I think that should fix the, the audio. I mean, if you're still having trouble hearing it. <clears throat> um, all right. So uh, just to start back for everyone online, our two models for simple harmonic motion, one of them is the, the pendulum, where you have a, an object that's swinging back and forth from a maximum potential energy to a maximum kinetic energy in the middle out to some other maximum potential, and it swings back and forth between potential and uh, kinetic like that. The other example of simple harmonic motion is a block on a spring. Uh, we know that the block and the spring are happy to just rest at equilibrium. However, if you stretch the block out and stretch the spring, the spring is going to pull the block back. And as it pulls the block back, it's going to give it some kinetic energy. And then that kinetic energy will compress the spring. And the spring will push it back out. And it'll vibrate back and forth like that um, in a motion called simple harmonic motion. It's just a cyclical motion that repeats over and over. We'll use the block here to develop our mathematical model to describe this motion. Setting the equilibrium as x equals 0. We know that we want to pull the block out to a positive maximum at some value. We call this the amplitude, so we'll call it x equals a. And then we know the block is going to snap back and push into the spring and go into some negative amplitude, which we'll call x equals negative a. It's like the minimum, right? So it'll oscillate back and forth between positive a and negative a. And we need a mathematical tool that enables us to describe an oscillation. This is why we go for sine or cosine waves. This is kind of a hand wavy explanation. The more rigorous explanation is uh, it's a second order differential equation and the solution to any second order differential equation has to include sine and cosines. So uh, for our purposes though, we just wanted to find the position of this block. So we can do physics because all of our physics is defined in terms of position and how it changes. So our position as a function of time, uh, as I mentioned, sine or cosine. In this class, we happen to choose cosine. And um, uh, one thing to note is that our cosine function is going to uh, oscillate between positive and negative one. We want it to go between positive and negative a. So all we need to do is just throw an a out in front of the cosine. Now we have a cosine function that's going to go between positive and negative a. Inside of the cosine function, we know we want cosine to vary with time. Um, so we're going to have a time in there. However, mathematically, cosine can only be evaluated on either degrees or radians. We can't evaluate it on seconds. So we need something that will take seconds and turn it into degrees or radians. This is where I'm going to make the first of several notes here. That this is the one problem in this class. It's problem one on the homework where you need to move into radian mode. It's only when you're actually about evaluating what's inside the parentheses. Anyway, we want to turn seconds into radians. How do we do that? We need to multiply seconds by radians per second, which is where our old friend omega comes back in. Omega, formerly called the uh, angular velocity, it still has that designation. The angular velocity is the same thing as the angular frequency. That's just a new name that we're going to also apply to it, the angular frequency. So here's some definitions for omega. Omega is two pi times f. F is a frequency in hertz. That's a common frequency that you'll hear. Uh, and um, since this little f is also the inverse of the period, you can say that omega is two pi over the period. And you may want to make a note of that somewhere if you don't already know it. Frequency is one over period. I think that that's covered in probably pre calc or something, but just as a note that still applies. There's one other definition which I will come back to, uh, but for right now, I'm just going to mention it so that it's all in the same place in your notes. Omega is also the square root of k over m for a block of mass m vibrating on a spring of constant k. All right, so we have these omega definitions. We're going to do a ton with them. Most of the time, other than problem one in the homework, you're going to be dealing with omega a lot more than you're actually dealing with like the sines and cosines. One other thing that we do need to do here, now that we have a position function, is we can also get the velocity and acceleration relatively quickly. How do we do that? Derivative, ddt. Derivative of position with respect to time will give you velocity with respect to time. I'm cool with that. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, 
we are uh, differentiating a cosine that has a time inside of it, but also there's a, an expression inside of that cosine. In other words, we need to be mindful here of the chain rule. So we'll differentiate the cosine that'll give us a negative sign. And then we also need to chain rule what's inside the cosine. Derivative of omega t with respect to t is just omega. So that's why I'm gonna pull an omega out front. I have negative a omega sine of omega t. One more derivative, ddt, will give us an acceleration with respect to time. Same thing's gonna happen here. We differentiate the sine and we'll get cosine and then we chain rule the inside and recover another, or pull another omega out front. So we'll have negative A omega squared cosine of omega T. In problem one in your homework, you're gonna be responsible for these. In every other simple harmonic motion problem that you're gonna do more or less, so quizzes and exams, the most important thing that's gonna come off of these equations is the amplitudes that are out in front. So we defined big A to be the amplitude of the position function. In doing our calculus here, we've gotten a definition for the velocity amplitude, A omega, and the acceleration amplitude, A omega squared. To write these all together then, the maximum X value is equal to A as we defined it. The maximum velocity function then is a omega and the maximum acceleration is a omega squared. If you can use these definitions for the maxima along with these different definitions for omega, you're gonna be good on nine out of 10 simple harmonic motion problems. So uh, those are the most important things here. As I mentioned in problem one, we actually do need to use X of T and B of T. So let's take a look at problem one. We have uh, two objects that are oscillating back and forth. They're oscillating along a string with a given length. They tell us the length is uh, 1.2 meters. And um, they tell us they have the same period. Both of them have a period of 4.6 seconds. And then they, they mentioned that there is a phase difference. And I'll, I'll come back to where the phase difference comes in. You, and, and a lot of your definitions for the, the functions and stuff, there's a phase difference included. Um, it so rarely comes up that I tend to just uh, only mention it you know, when it does come up like this. They tell us that our phase difference is pi over six. So just take me on my word here when I say that delta phi is equal to pi over six. We'll come back to how to use that in just a second. All right, um, and great. So we wanna find how far apart they are. We just wanna find the difference in the positions, which means we need to write some position functions. So we're just practicing writing our A cosine omega T, A cosine omega T for each one. So to start off, we need an A. Well, I know that they're gonna move over a total distance of 1.2. That means I need to cut that in half to find the amplitude. The amplitude is the distance from the middle to the edge. So as I'm writing the equation, for say particle one, x one of t, my amplitude is 1.2 on two. And then I'll have my cosine. <clears throat> Inside, I need my omega. I don't have omega, but from the very important equations here, I know that omega does relate to the frequency and the period, and I know I have the period. So, my omega is two pi over the period, which means I can write the omega as two pi over 4.6. Go ahead and plug that in inside here, two pi on 4.6 T. And then we're good, that's your first particle. For the second particle, Second particle is going to be identical. It's got the same amplitude, has the same period, so it'll have the same frequency. The only difference is that it's going to be phase shifted by pi over six. So this is where this comes in. If it's phase shifted by pi over six, that means that they're not vibrating back and forth in step with one another. 
Instead, one of the particles is going to be ahead a little bit. So we need to shift its cosine function in the t direction. The way we shift in the t direction is by adding this pi over six inside the parentheses. All that is to say that x2 of t is going to be identical, 1.2 on 2 cosine of 2 pi on 4.6 t, with the one exception that we're adding in our phase shift of pi over 6. <clears throat> and there you go. You have your position functions uh, for part A, where they ask you to actually uh, find the distance between them. You know, the distance between them is just going to be the absolute value of x1 evaluated at the time that they give, which is for me is 1.4 seconds, minus x2 evaluated at 1.4 seconds. They just take the absolute value to find the distance between them. Again, reminder number two, that this is the one problem this semester where you need to be in radian mode, calculate that. <clears throat> For part B, they ask us if they're moving in the same direction, if they're moving toward or away from each other. For that one, uh, you just need to write down the velocity functions. So we have two ways of getting the velocity function now. Number one is to differentiate the position functions that we just generated ourselves. Or number two is just to use the general velocity function that you have uh, produced on the last slide. And we can go ahead and just plug everything in there. Um, in either case, your V1 of T will be negative 1.2 on two, the amplitude times omega, which is two pi on 4.6, and then times sine of two pi on 4.6 T. And then A omega sine omega T. And then V2 is still going to be phase shifted. The phase shift isn't gonna affect the derivative because we do the chain rule on pi over six, that's just gonna go to zero. So you'll have everything here is gonna be the same. The only difference is gonna be inside the parentheses instead of having two pi on 4.6 T, we'll have two pi on 4.6 T plus pi over six. And then you get that they're moving in the same direction. <clears throat> okay. And as promised, uh, that's, that should be the only problem that you're going to do this semester where you need to evaluate sine and cosine. I suppose it could be on an exam, it could be on a quiz. But um, for the most part, the thing we need to practice is problem number two. Problem number two is going to be a very good one to study for the quiz and for the exam, especially. Um, it's a five part problem where they're just asking you to do calculations, and each of them you're using two or maybe three equations uh, to do the calculations. So, uh, to start off, they give us a bunch of information. They tell us we have a mass of 87 grams. Remember, that needs to be in kilograms before I can do anything with it. Uh, and the particle is going to go sim undergo simple harmonic motion. They give us the amplitude explicitly. So, that'll be big A, uh, 3.6 millimeters. Again, I need to convert that to meters before I can do anything with it. They give us the maximum acceleration. Cool, that's A max. And that maximum acceleration is, for me, five times 10 to the third. The maximum acceleration is in meters per second, so we don't need to convert the units. And then they tell you there's an unknown phase constant. It's not important. It doesn't come up. I don't even know why they tell us that. So here's your givens. We need to give all of our answers in terms of these three givens. And it turns out we can do quite a bit knowing just the amplitude and the maximum acceleration. Uh, so the first thing they want us to find is the period. All right, so what definition do we have for period? Well, our only pathway right now to get from period into the rest of this stuff is to relate period to omega. We know period is two pi over omega. And uh, omega is going to kind of be the key here. I know that my amplitudes are related with an omega. I have uh, an expression or uh, an equation for the maximum acceleration. Maximum acceleration is A omega squared. So that's going to be kind of our key here. Our A max is big A omega squared. 
And I can solve this for omega. I have omega is equal to a max over big A, all under square root. And just go ahead and plug that in for omega on the bottom. And what you get is that the period is two pi times the square root of the reciprocal of this, big A over little a max. This is exactly the type of thing that you want to be able to do with simple harmonic motion. Here we're using two equations together to relate some amplitudes to a period. Okay. Part B, they ask us to find the maximum speed of the particle. Maximum speed is V max. I know that this is just A omega. Now that I've found an omega right here, I can plug in. I have A times square root of A max over big A. If you'd like to simplify that a little bit, that's just square root of big A times A max. Again, two equations fused together. Notice how we use one with frequency, one with the amplitudes. Kind of get the idea here. Uh, part C now, they ask us about the total mechanical energy. Now I'm gonna come back to total mechanical energy, but uh, I'm just gonna give you the definitions. You have two definitions for total mechanical energy. You're gonna to wanna to know both of them. Your mechanical energy is passed back and forth between potential and kinetic energy. So you can define it in terms of the maximum potential energy, which is one half Ka squared, or the maximum kinetic energy, which is one half mv max squared. Um, for this problem, which one is a, is a more straightforward path through? Let's see, I have the amplitude, I do not have the K. I know I could tie K into omega and go through that route. I do have the mass given. Do I have V max? Oh, well, I've already found an expression for it right here. So I could go ahead and plug that in and you get that your energy is a half and big A, little a max. This just happens to be a, a solution for this problem, but this equation is important for the total mechanical energy. Um, okay, and then uh, D and E, they're both asking about the spring force. So uh, the spring force, you have sort of two ways to solve this for D and E. I'm gonna kind of do them side by side. Uh, we know the spring force is Kx. We also know that F is equal to Ma. If I want to find the uh, um, what's the most straightforward way? Let's see, I have my mass given. I have the acceleration in terms of A and omega. Uh, not sure either one of them is necessarily. Oh, well, no, they asked about maximum displacement. Okay, so we want to relate this back to, to displacement for both D and E. Um, so I'm just going to go with the straightforward way. You, you can get there if you're looking at like cosine and cosine and how the position and the acceleration are both going to be at maximums at the same time. Some people will see that and say, okay, whenever you're at maximum displacement, you're at maximum acceleration and we can just do MA. For everyone who doesn't see it that way, uh, we just need to replace our K here with some terms that we do have. So I know that omega is equal to root K over M. Solving this for K, we have K is equal to M omega squared. And I can, let's see. Uh, oh, and then I know that my omega is square root of A max over A. So this is M times little a max over big A. And I can plug that in for K. And this will give me that my force is M times little a max over big A times X. And then for X, we can plug in two different things. For D, for part D, they want to know when you're at maximum displacement. So when X is equal to A, notice when I plug in X equals A right here, uh, my A's will cancel. I just have F equals MA. 
And then for part E, they ask us to do when X is equal to A over two. Notice if I plug in X equals A over two, again, A cancel, I just have MA over two. So the more straightforward way is just to say that, you know, when we're at half displacement, we'd be at half acceleration as well. And you can just plug in your M right here and your A max and relate that to how much displacement you have. Okay. Um, I did mention that I want to come back to energy. I think the energy is an important thing to be able to deal with uh, with simple harmonic motion. You don't necessarily need to write this down, but what I do want to mention is that uh, with both of these examples, both the pendulum and the block, in both cases, you have potential energy maximum when kinetic is zero to kinetic maximum potential is zero, back to potential, back to kinetic. That energy is passed back and forth. We know it has to be conserved. So that means that your kinetic maximum has to be equal to your potential maximum. Again, you don't need to write this down. Your kinetic maximum is one half mv max squared. Your potential maximum is one half ka squared. We've covered that in the last page, but just a reminder, you should be familiar with both those definitions. Um, all right, and then we also know that v max is a omega. So this is m a omega squared, or one half m a omega squared is one half ka squared. A one half cancels out of both sides. I have an a squared on both sides. Now I have m omega squared is equal to k, which gives me omega is squared of k over m. So that's where that definition comes from. I think it's just important to reiterate that you do have energy like this. I have seen exam problems where they say you have a, uh, a you know a potential of 10 joules at a certain time. There's a total mechanical energy of 20 joules. What is the speed at that time? So you have to be able to figure out that you have a kinetic energy uh, that is you know, the, the difference between those two and then, and then solve from there. So definitely want to keep in mind, energy is on the table here, um, uh, especially on the exam. Okay, uh, problem number three now, we're going to move into pendulums. And problem number three is a good one because it kind of walks us through this very strange pendulum definition that we have. All the pendulums that we've dealt with in this class so far, are what's called a simple pendulum. I don't even think we've, we've called it that because there's only been one type of pendulum. You have a massless string with a point mass on the end. It's a simple pendulum, it swings back and forth. In this chapter, we're finally gonna discuss something called a physical pendulum. A physical pendulum has mass distributed throughout. Of course, your string has mass. And problem number three, it's actually gonna be a rod attached to a disc. And they tell us that the rod has a length L and the disc has a radius little r. And they give us the masses of each as well. So we'll go ahead and call this rod little m and the disc big M. And they're gonna walk us through here uh, calculating the period of this pendulum. So here is a, an equation for the period of a physical pendulum. It's two pi times the square root of I around a pivot, the inertia, the rotational inertia about the pivot over MGD. And I do want to mention that this mass is the total mass. I did get that question. We want the inertia of this whole system around the pivot point at the end of the rod. And then on the bottom, we also have this little D. D is the distance to the center of mass. Now this problem asks us to actually walk through these steps uh, one by one. So starting with part A, they ask us to calculate the rotational inertia of the whole system. So our inertia around the pivot point. I have two objects here. I have a rod, I have a disc. My total inertia then is the inertia of the rod plus the inertia of the disc. For the rod's inertia, you may think of the uh, rod through the middle as 1 12th ml squared. There's also an inertia about the end of the rod that is given on your formula sheet, I believe. Uh, the inertia about the end is one third ml squared. So you're allowed to know that for free. You can just go ahead and write that down. It'll be one third little m big L squared. And we're done with the rod's con contribution to the inertia. We then just need to consider the inertia from the disc. So I know the inertia of the disc around its center that is another one that I'm allowed to know. It's a half mr squared. 
So that'll be one half big N R squared. However, I do not want the inertia of the disc around its center. I want the inertia of the disc around the end of the rod. How do I move that inertia from the center of the disc to the end of the rod? Yeah, cool. So, yeah, yeah, we all got it. You know, plus mh squared or the parallel axis theorem, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's going to be the parallel axis theorem is the name of it. And we just tack on a plus mh squared where h is just the distance that we move it. So we're just going to add the mass of the just the disk itself, big N, times the distance that we want to move our axis. We want to move it little r plus big L. So little r plus big L, and that'll be squared because it's again mh squared. If you'd like to make a note, for when you're looking back later, you can just write, this was the parallel axis right here. So we did the parallel axis term. Okay, and then uh, nothing really simplifies here. I guess you could, I don't know. You probably don't want to expand that binomial in the second, in the third term. So, but you do have all those uh, values. You can go and plug them in and find the inertia. Um, for part B, they say, all right, now you found the inertia. Now we're going to walk you through finding that little d on the bottom. Remember, little d is the center of mass distance. The center of mass equation that I always use, like the default one, was x. The x center of mass is the sum of the mi xi's over the sum of the mi's, right? Here, it's not actually an x. It's a radial, right? Because we're kind of moving along a circle. So I'm just going to adopt that a little bit to do the radius center of mass is the sum of the mi ri's over the sum of the mi's. But it's, you know, the same uh, equation that we're used to. <clears throat> and cool. So we have two objects. Each object is going to have a, a contribution. The first one is the rod. The rod has a mass little m. And its center of mass is located at the middle of the rod, which is half the length from the end of the rod, L over 2. We need to add in. The contribution from the disk. The disk has a mass big N. The distance from the center of mass of the disk to the pivot point is little r plus L. So that'll be little r plus L. It's not squared or anything. So we just leave it like that. Divide by the sum of the masses, which is little n plus big M. Again, not really much uh, compelling work to be done here as far as simplifying or anything. You just plug in your values. In part C, then, they say, all right, put it all together. Go ahead and find the period. Period is 2 pi times the square root of the inertia around the pivot point. That's what we found in part A. Over the mass. This is, again, the total mass, little m plus big N, times g times D, which is the distance to the center of mass. And that's what we found in part B. So you just put your two answers together. Uh, you could cancel out, if you were to plug in this expression from B in the bottom, you could cancel out the total masses, but there's not really much else to be done to clean it up. Uh, just make sure you don't round too much when you're plugging into your calculator. <clears throat> okay. So there we go, we have a physical pendulum. Now we can deal with physical pendulums on our own and we're gonna be super stars when it comes to next week. Problem number four is a little bit of an advanced physical pendulum problem. First of all, we have an object that is rotating that has an inertia, which I don't think we've actually done anything with yet this semester. It's a rectangular block and the rectangular block has side lengths A and B. And there's a center of mass for the block. And we're gonna drill a hole in the block at a distance r from the center. And we're going to pivot the block around that hole or through that hole. And uh, they ask us to investigate the period through that hole. So first thing is, before we get into actually solving the problem, let's start by calculating the period. I know my period is 2 pi times the square root of the inertia around that pivot, which is my new hole, over and G D, the distance from the center of mass to that hole. So maybe we'll start off there, right? So our period is two pi times the square root of 
I'm starting the bottom, MGD. D is the distance from the center of mass to the pivot point that is explicitly called little r in our picture. So we'll go ahead and just replace that with little r. The inertia uh, is a little strange. Um, for one, uh, this is actually a shape that is on your formula sheet. Uh, the inertia of a rectangular block of side lengths a and b is a squared plus b squared on 12 times the mass. Um, if that, that 12 sounds familiar, it's because if you let you know, a go to zero, then you recover the inertia of a rod, which has an infinitesimal width. Uh, one twelfth ml squared. Anyway, we're allowed to know that the center of mass inertia from the formula sheet, a squared plus b squared on 12 times the mass. We then need to, uh, again, parallel axis theorem to adjust our inertia. We need to do plus mh squared, where h is how far we're moving from the center of mass to the pivot point. It's explicitly been called R. So this will be MR squared. All right. Now, uh, we could immediately cancel out the masses if we'd like. Um, we can also pull that square root of G out and distribute the R. So we'd actually get something like this, two pi on root G, I pulled out my G from the bottom, times the square root of A squared plus B squared on 12R plus R squared over R is just going to give us R. I usually don't do this type of simplification. The reason why I'm doing this type of simplification is because in this problem specifically, they ask us to find a value of R for which this period is going to be at a minimum. I want to find a value r such that this function is at a minimum. How do I find the minimum of a function? Take a derivative, right? You differentiate that equal to zero. Yeah, this is physics with calc. So we are responsible for a little bit of calc. Um, all right, so this could be a very messy derivative. I'm waving my hands quite a bit here, but I'll just mention that uh, if we want this whole period function to be uh, at a minimum, uh, since it is always going to be positive, we can also just minimize what is underneath the square root. So we're going to do DDR, the derivative with respect to R, of just the stuff underneath the square root, A squared plus B squared on 12R plus R. <clears throat> uh, differentiating that first term, this is really some stuff times R to the negative one. So we multiply by the negative one and then decrease it to negative two. So we'll have a negative sign out front, a squared plus b squared on 12. Now my r to the negative one becomes r to the negative two. So we have 12r squared on the bottom. And then we'll differentiate that second term. The derivative of r is just plus one. And again, we wanna minimize this function. So we wanna set its derivative equal to zero. Ultimately, we're looking for a value of r, so we find r is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared all over 12. And you plug in your a and b to find that answer. Does anyone recognize what shape is described? Yeah, it's a circle, right? If you don't see the circle, think about uh, replacing a with x and b with y. Then you have some r squared is equal to uh, x squared plus y squared over 12, right? Which is the pre-calc definition of a circle. Um, so that happens to be the, the answer to part b, is that this would be a circle that's described here. And that means that you can sort of drill anywhere so long as you're at this certain radius. All right. Um, so that's it on physical pendulums. Make sure you can do physical pendulums. That'd be a good candidate for a quiz problem. And of course, a uh, homework problem or uh, an exam problem as well. You probably probably would do something with the period of, of this difficulty 
but rather than doing a derivative, you'd be doing this type of problem with it. That would be something uh, to be aware of for the quiz and exam. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and uh, we're gonna talk about a suspension system in a car. Uh, this happens to be really just the perfect application of this idea. So you got a car. Beautiful. <clears throat> Cars driving down the road. Uh, when they first, uh, was the Model T the first car? I don't know if that was the very first one. Anyway, when cars first came out, uh, they just had like, you know, axles just attached right to the body. You'd hit a bump in a car and you'd feel it. You'd feel the entire bump every single time you hit it. So engineers came back and they said, we got to make this feel a little bit easier because it like physically hurts to ride in this car. So what do they do? They put some springs in there and they said, you know, this time when we hit bumps, we'll get a little bumpy uh, and we'll just sort of oscillate a little bit. And that will dissipate the energy of the bump, especially when you're going at, at higher speeds, very important. There's a flip side though, which is that when a bump puts some energy into those springs, we know from our simple harmonic motion considerations that those springs just wanna keep vibrating forever, right? You put energy in the spring, now that spring's just gonna oscillate forever. If you've ever driven on a highway at high speeds in a car whose suspension was not tuned properly, you can hit resonance with the velocity of the wheels and the springs, and then you're bumping the whole way. It feels almost like you're riding on a, like a sound wave or an air wave or something like that. Um, so that is the flip side where you put too much energy into the car uh, and into those springs. So our goal is we want springs which lessen the impact of a bump, but then we want those springs to dissipate that energy very quickly so we're not bouncing up and down forever. Mathematically, what we wanna happen is we wanna take our cosine wave from our simple harmonic motion, and we want it to decay over time. So we want something like this. Now, you can do, uh, if, you, if you take in differential equations, or if you're going to at some point, you'll do the differential equation for, uh, for this problem, and you'll come up with this solution that's about to come up. Um, this one happens to be a second order, but you also have a first order term for the decay. But the point is that uh, the only thing that we need to be doing physics on in this class that we're responsible for is just to look at how the amplitude changes. Initially, and in this picture, our amplitude is just a constant value A. That's how we've been treating it uh, so far today. Now we want our amplitude to decay with time. And the way we're going to describe that decay mathematically is with a negative exponential, e to the negative x, roughly. And uh, this allows us to write an equation that I'll go ahead and write right now. I'm just going to sort of write it down. Uh, again, it comes from, from a differential equation solution, which you're not responsible for knowing in this class. But we do need to know that now we have an equation for the amplitude in terms of time. In terms of time, the amplitude is equal to a naught, the initial amplitude, times e to the negative bt over 2m. Talk about what all is going in here. a naught, obviously, our initial amplitude right here. That's your a naught. Uh, the mass is just the mass of the object that is. Uh, causing the vibrations. The only thing that's new here is this guy B, and B is what is called our damping coefficient. Damping means removing the vibrations. This is just essentially a measure of how efficient our system is at removing the vibrations or damping the system. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, on the homework problem, uh, there's two parts. Part A, they ask to find the spring constant. Um, this is just a homework problem thing where uh, they're given a, a mass for the automobile and a compression distance, and we need to find the spring constant. So for this, we'd set our Kx equal to mg, the weight that the Kx is supporting, in other words. And uh, you can solve for your K, it'll be you know, mg on x. For the second part of the homework problem, 
they say that the oscillation amplitude is going to decrease by 40% each cycle. What does this mean? So A is going to decrease by 40% in each cycle. <clears throat> Let's start off with the first part here. If our amplitude is decreasing by 40%, then what is our amplitude at some later time in terms of the initial amplitude? If it decreases by 40%, it's at how much of the original? I started at 100%, I go down by 40%. What percent am I at? 60, right? 100% minus 40. So just make sure you keep that straight. If my amplitude decreases by 40%, it means my amplitude is at 60% of my initial amplitude. The other piece here is that they tell us that this occurs over one cycle. One cycle is meant to give us a hint about the time. A cycle is the same as what? In terms of the quantities that we've defined today. What does, a what does one cycle tell us? Was it period? They said, yeah, good. It's one period, right? One cycle is one period. So that means, perfect, that we can substitute our time is equal to just a period. And then we just need to uh, find an expression for the period. So I know that my period is, and this is an equation that we maybe haven't seen yet, but this is just a reworking of two of those omega equations. Our period is 2 pi times the square root of m over k. And then I have a definition for k right here that I can go ahead and plug in. I can write this as 2 pi when I cancel out my m's because k is on the bottom. You have 2 pi times the square root of x on g. And then we can go ahead and put this all together. So we're going to use this equation. This right here defines our left hand side. And this stuff right here is going to go into the right hand side just to put that all together. The left-hand side is going to be 0 0.6 A naught. The right-hand side is going to be A naught times E to the negative B on 2M times this crazy thing right here, 2 pi root X on G. There's a lot going on there. Uh, ultimately, we need to solve for the damping coefficient B. So I'll just mention we're going to cancel out A naught. We need to get B out of the exponent of the exponential. How do we do that? Good, natural log. Yeah, I just wanted us to all say those words out loud so that we, we know that we need to do a natural log here. And yeah, you'd have the natural log of 0 0.6 on the left-hand side will be equal to the exponent on the right-hand side. So negative B on 2N times 2 pi root X over G. All right, and then you can do a little more work, you know, do, do more work from there. Uh, obviously it simplifies a little bit, but this is where you'll find your damping coefficient. Um, all right, give everybody a second to copy that one down. Uh, the last one then that we'll do, this will get us through chapter 15, at least. Uh, problem number six. Problem number six just goes back to, uh, it's, a, it's a very long thing. It's one of those flying circuits of physics problems where they have a very convoluted setup. An earthquake is vibrating some rocks, yada, yada, yada. They give us a frequency. They tell us our frequency is 1.50 hertz. Which frequency is hertz? I mentioned this a second ago, but which frequency is it? Or a few minutes ago, I guess. That's, was it? Uh, if you see a unit of Hertz, I just wanted to make this point. If you see a unit of Hertz, that's a frequency little f. So that's not a radian per second. One Hertz is one inverse second. It's like a wave per second. So if you see units of Hertz, sometimes that's the only indication that you get that you have a frequency f. The reason why that's important is because omega, which we've defined all of our stuff in terms of, is 2 pi times that little frequency f. 
So you take Hertz, multiply by two pi, you get radians per second. Um, yeah, so I, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. That, that part is important. It's probably the most important part here. Uh, other than that, we are given an amplitude of 0 0.9 centimeters. Again, we need to make sure we convert to meters there. And we are asked to find the magnitude of the acceleration. Um, the acceleration amplitude is, in other words, the maximum acceleration. It's A omega squared. And I have my A, and I have something that relates to omega. So this will be A times 2 pi F squared. <clears throat> this is going to give you a value for the acceleration in meters per second squared. Uh, the problem is going to ask for the acceleration in terms of uh, G. So like in terms of 9.8, as you might have thought, you might have heard this in like rocket, like if a rocket is moving at like 4G, um, then you need to divide by 9.8. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so your, uh, your A max, uh, as a ratio to G is, uh, going to be, you know, four pi squared F squared times A over, uh, that G constant 9.8. And this will actually end up being your answer here. All right. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we'll go over the rest of this in uh, office hours on Thursday.